Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, if you are joining us from, from Europe, and a warm welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. My name is Dalbo Rohac, or Rohak if you've given up on Central European accents. Um, I'm a resident scholar here at the AI, where I work on all things Europe, from questions of European integration, through questions of post-communist transitions, democratic backsliding in, in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, to questions of transatlantic relations. And I should say that I was first hired by AEI back in 2015 to help make sense of the developments in Viktor Orban's Hungary. Um, at the time, uh, there was all, only a burgeoning discussion, especially on the center right, about uh, how to confront um, the questions that, that this brand of nationalist populism uh, has, has raised. Uh, in, in, in conservative, conservative circles. Um, a few months after I was hired, um, Poland followed much the same trajectory with, uh, with the leader of Law and Justice Party, Jarosław Kaczynski, promising earlier uh, to build a Budapest in Warsaw. Um, but even then, I think few of us expected the magnitude of the challenge that this de-democratization, if you, if you will, would represent. I think the assumption that I made when the others made was uh, that there was a problem which was being largely ignored by EU's big players, by the United States. And once mm. these were alerted to the problem, uh, they had the means to, to address it. Um, the idea that the EU would allow this problem to fester for another five years uh, would probably strike me as, as, as thoroughly and unnecessarily uh, pessimistic. And if somebody told me that a US administration would actively cheer on for, for a de-democratization the, of the sort we saw, we've seen in, in Hungary and, and Poland. Uh, I, I don't think I would have believed them. Here, yet, here we are. Um, after several unfruitful attempts to invoke Article 7 procedure on the rule of law, uh, I thought that the EU had a moment of reckoning with um, the seven year budget and the post pandemic recovery package, which, uh, which was supposed to be conditional on, 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 on meeting some criteria of the, of the rule of law. Yet uh, the entire block ended up being host held hostage by, by the governments of Poland and Hungary and eventually capitulated to, <laughs> to those demands. Uh, Viktor Orban was received in, in the Oval Office back in 2018, I believe, or 19. Um, time flies. Um, and he is still being celebrated in some Republican circles as a hero of sorts, notwithstanding policies that, that have oftentimes uh, went, uh, gone against US interest in the region. At the same time, and I think that should be the message uh, of, of, of this event, uh, Central and Eastern Europe is not a homogeneous place, and it does not offer a uniformly uh, bleak picture. Whatever their problems, the Baltic states, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia have really not gone down the same path as, as Hungary and, and Poland. And I think neither Poland and Hungary are beyond the point of no return. Um, since Wednesday, there's also a new administration in Washington, uh, which has promised to make democracy and rule of law a, a priority, including in, enga in engaging with Central and Eastern Europe. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, five very distinguished voices from Central Europe for a conversation about the nature of the challenge that we are facing, about its significance for the future of the European Union, and also about how it is likely to shape the transatlantic partnership um, going forward. I want to say a few very brief words about our speakers before handing it over to them for brief opening, opening remarks. But I should also say that this is a public event, live streamed on our website, on our YouTube channel. Uh, therefore, everything that is being said is, is being said on the record and will be used against you, uh, but I hope you won't pull any punches nonetheless. Um, uh, I should also tell our viewers that they can already start asking questions, either emailing my colleague Lance Kokonos uh, at uh, lance.kokonos, uh, that is L-A-N-C-E dot K-O-K-O-N-O-S at AEI.org. Uh, or on Twitter using the hashtag AI Visegrad. Um, I'd like to start the conversation uh, 
with Professor Jacques Rupnik, who's a research professor at Sciences Po in Paris, who will provide sort of broader, high-level overview of the of the region. I think he's the right person to do this because he was born to a French Slovenian family in Prague. He was brought up in the Czech Republic, and he is at home intellectually, culturally, uh, both in Central Europe and in France. And and he has provided over the years a uniquely valuable bridge, I think, between between the two parts. Of, of, of the European Union between the two parts of, of Europe that oftentimes end up talking past each other. Um, he played a hugely important role, uh, both uh, in supporting Czechoslovak dissidents in the 1980s and also in advising uh, President Václav Havel in the 1990s. Uh, and then I'd like to move actually in alphabetical order to, to Kathleen Czech, who is a physician by training um, and a member of the European Parliament. Uh, and uh, she will talk about the Hungarian situation, especially as the country braces for a parliamentary election uh, next year. Uh, Katka is a member uh, for, uh, for, for the Momentum Movement, which she helped co-found, uh, and which has also been now at the forefront of, uh, of efforts to unite the Hungarian opposition going into the election. Um, I'll then turn to uh, Rastislav Kacer, who is currently um, the Slovak ambassador to the Czech Republic, um, who I hope will talk about the internal divides within, within, within Central Europe and, 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 and sort of distinguishing features of, of, of especially these four Visegrad countries. Um, uh, and I think the idea that the entire region is in some grip of nationalism, Euroscepticism and, and populism is, is just wrong. And I think, I think Rastislav is the right person to disentangle What's going on in different places? Because he, uh, is, among other things, is a Hungarian speaker. He served as the ambassador to Budapest, and he also uh, has the transatlantic angle covered, having served also as Slovakia's ambassador to to the United, uh, to the United States. Um, I'll then turn to uh, Ludwig Niedermeyer, who is a member of European Parliament from the centre right uh, Top Zero Nine party and the vice chair of European Parliament's committee on. Uh, economic monetary affairs. Uh, the Czech Republic is holding a parliamentary election in the fall of this year. Uh, and I think the Czech Republic provides a fairly interesting case study of a, of a country which has had a populist government led by Andrei Babiš, one of the wealthiest men in the country, yet it was a gov it's a government uh, that has shown a degree of restraint, particularly compared to, to the Polish and, and, and Hungarian. Uh, Hungarian ones, and has certainly not sought to aggressively fight against uh, the existing checks and balances, judicial review, or or, or, or civil society, or or independent media. And finally, I hope we'll be joined uh, by by Radek Sikorski, who I, I, I don't see him on this call, but but hopefully he'll be he'll be he'll be tuning in soon. Uh, he's an MEP from Poland, chair of European Parliament's delegation for relations with the US former speaker of the same, the lower chamber of, of Polish parliament, uh, former foreign minister, uh, and hopefully he'll, he'll, he'll enlighten us about, about the Polish situation. Uh, but now, without any further ado, over to Jacques Rupnik. Hello, good morning to you uh, in Washington. It's good afternoon to my uh, European colleagues uh, who will be on this uh, panel. In fact, all of them could have done this introductory uh, uh, remarks. I I'll try to be very brief. We were given a very broad question about um, the de-democratization and uh, the possibility to reverse it. I will not dwell on describing the de-democratization. You are familiar with the main feature. I will not inflict on you the academic uh, debates and, and the numbers provided by Freedom House, uh, which incidentally, uh, uh, I'm not interested in what Freedom House says at a given, at a particularly given moment when it says, you know, Lithuania democracy 1.94. Well, you know, that's too scientific to be true. Uh, what matters is a trend. You measure the development over, let's say, a quarter of a century, and you see the trend, and you have the countries that were the success story of the democratic transition after 1989, which have now become uh, um, 
a problem for the European Union in terms of uh, democratic backsliding, it was called at first, now de-democratization. Some people like Timothy Gartenash say, you know, Hungary is now a one-party state, is no longer a democracy. For the first time, some people say, um, Jan Werner Müller, others, we have inside the European Union a non-democratic country. So there are, there's a varieties of assessments. Uh, some of them seem to me going uh, perhaps too far because they don't leave enough open the question about what can be done about it and is it re and how reversible it is and I believe it is reversible and I will try to uh, say uh, uh, why so I will not dwell on the description it's you're familiar with it it essentially concerns the separation of powers uh, the independence the constitutionalism in a nutshell, uh, the respect for the constitution, the separation of power, the independence of the judiciary and the independence of the media. These are the main features. Now, the question uh, uh, Dalibor asked us, you know, uh, is it just a Polish Hungarian syndrome? Is it Central Europe as a whole, Visegrad? Or is, there, or is it a broader European question? Well, uh, my answer is it's, it's all three. Uh, you have, uh, yes, Poland and Hungary are the two countries that went furthest in this trend over the last decade in Hungary, over the last five years uh, in Poland, uh, in, uh, in this democratic regression and uh, the challenge to the, to, to, the, to the rule of law. And of course, the question that is raised is uh, to what extent have they changed the rules of the game to such an extent that it makes it almost impossible or very difficult for this uh, for the opposition to be able to win an election so this is the, the whole discussion about competitive authoritarianism you still have competition but you have diminishing chances of actually having a free and fair competition so uh, that is uh, poland and 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 hungary these are the two countries that went furthest and where the issue is the most obvious. Often they lump together with Visegrad, essentially because the Visegrad countries took a joint stance on not accepting migrants, not accepting the EU quota system for migrants. And also because there was a problem with the rule of law in Slovakia, as we have discovered in the aftermath of the Kuciak affair, the, the, the uh, journalist that was assassinated, and the revelations about the scale of the uh, judiciary, uh, political, criminal uh, interplay in the countries. And uh, 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 we have uh, seen that, uh, and this is why Czech and Slovak situation differ. In Slovakia, we have seen that this crisis, which raised the question of the rule of law, provided a catharsis, a popular mobilization around those issues, and a change of government. Uh, you will ask, well, is this government a liberal government? Well, you know, they, they, they are a different brand of populist, but at least the people who are directly connected to this illiberal trend uh, have, been, have been removed from power uh, in, uh, in uh, the election that took place at the beginning uh, of, uh, of last year. Uh, uh, in the Czech case, uh, Dalibor referred to it, you still have independence of the judiciary, you have separation of powers, you have the independent media, the constitutional court plays its part and has on numerous occasions uh, demonstrated that. So uh, there are common features, there are common problems, but the Czech and Slovak case prevent us from treating the region as a block. It's no longer a Soviet block, if you want. It's no longer an Eastern block or a Visegrad block. And is it a European problem? Yes, it is. It, we find all over Europe, parties, political movements, etc., that are very much on the same wavelengths. Uh, Salvini in, in Italy and his Lega, uh, the Austrian FPO, etc. I could go through the long list of them. All of the European countries have them. The main difference, of course, is that in Central and Eastern Europe, they happen to be in power. Uh, in Western Europe, they are there, but they are uh, mainly in opposition. 
And uh, so that is that is the situation we are confronted. Uh, uh, that is that is a landscape. You could you could draw sort of the most acute Hungary and Poland. Yes, it is a problem in 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 uh, the Czech Republic and and, and Slovakia, but to, in in a different context. And the European question as a whole is raised, and mainly on the political level. To what extent is EU capable politically? to uh, confront this challenge. And this is what brings me to the latest developments and, uh, uh, and the situation that uh, you have all uh, uh, followed. And the dilemma was following. Uh, yes, the rule of law question has been raised with Poland, uh, with the previous commission, Mr. Timmermans, the commissioner had, was the most adamant in raising it. It was raised with Hungary. There's a European parliament, et cetera, et cetera. That is a process you are probably familiar. The turning point came this year, I mean, last year, uh, when uh, in confronting the COVID situation and the economic uh, uh, disaster it has produced, the European rescue package had to be adopted unanimously. And there was Poland and Hungary who uh, 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 categorically were refusing uh, to link the attribution of the funds from this rescue package, but also from uh, the uh, European budget for the future uh, budgetary period of the EU starting next year, uh, refusing to connect that to, to make it conditional on the observance of the rule of law. So you had two capacities, two countries with the capacity to uh, impose a veto. And without that, uh, uh, you uh, couldn't get it through. And Europe was divided roughly the following way. You had the Northern countries, the so-called frugals, who are not only budget in, uh, uh, let's say, cautious on budgetary matters, but they were the most adamant about the respect of the rule of law as a condition for receiving any EU funds. And then you had the, mainly the southern countries, which were most also uh, affected by, uh, by COVID, such as Italy, uh, Spain, et cetera, who uh, uh, were thinking, well, yes, there is this question of the rule of law, but we need to fix. Uh, uh, the economy first. And this rescue package is new because for the first time the EU is borrowing as such. It's no longer individual countries. There is a joint responsibility, there is a joint solidarity, and that is more important than dealing with the rule of law issue in a particular country. So this is a EU debate, a kind of north-south divide where those who are the most, let's say, who take the rule of law issue most seriously were also the most cautious on the budgetary and the rescue package and the southern country that were divided. So we have not just an east-west divide on this, we have also a north-south divide. Where are we? I, I, I'm just concluding uh, uh, not to take too much time. Uh, I don't have a clock in front of me, but I, 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 I'm, I'm sure I'm uh, uh, running over time. Uh, uh, what are uh, what are the limits on this process? Oh, because before we speak about capacity to reverse it, <laughs> let's first see what are its limits, uh, and, and then maybe we will see. Now there is internal and external, and maybe in the discussion for each country we can we can discuss it. Internal. That is very much the capacity of civil society to mobilize. I mentioned the Slovak case where civil society mobilized. Poland is, of course, the country where civil society mobilization is the most powerful. And that can be a check on how far any liberal government uh, uh, can, uh, uh, can go. The second issue is how much the opposition in a given country is capable of uniting against a, an illiberal or semi-authoritarian government, uh, because divided, they, they've been losing and they would be losing in the future. For the first time, we see Hungarian opposition saying they will be united, and 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 I suppose we will hear about that, including with Jobbik, which to many people will be a, a surprise. It is not to me because I've been uh, uh, watching it carefully, but it is it is an so capacity of 
the opposition uh, to unite. And we have seen, this is a third important factor, that these are not uh, homogeneous societies. These are divided societies, uh, all of these. And therefore we have cities, for instance, you take the joint statement of the mayors of uh, Budapest, Prague, Bratislava, Warsaw, joint statement, not just endorsing liberal values, but defending uh, also the European Union, the, their commitment uh, to the European project. So we see that we are not dealing with homogeneous society. So this is a possibility, uh, civil society, opposition, urban centers. External limits, external possibilities of change. Well, in the old days, I would have said, you know, the role, the example, the shining examples of American democracy, uh, uh, Britain and America, the two uh, bastions of liberal democracy. Well, that under Trump uh, uh, was no longer uh, uh, was no longer uh, a viable proposition, and uh, the defeat of Trump in the American election uh, is a blow to the little Trumps in uh, 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 Central Europe. Uh, so that, that, that is certainly a factor that will play. We will see how the new administration will, and, and that will come up in the discussion. So uh, that is one factor. The second thing is that the uh, allies of the Central European uh, illiberals or populist nationalists, as you want to call them. And I spoke of Visegrad, I should have added Slovenia's Jansha, the prime minister of Slovenia, who is probably the closest to Orban today uh, 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 with uh, uh, Kaczynski. Well, uh, 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 they've lost allies, other allies. Uh, they've lost uh, uh, Salvini, who was member of the Italian uh, and his Lega who were part of the government. And they've lost the, Ita the Austrian, uh, 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 FPÖ, the extreme right wing, who are in the government. So you have uh, been, they have been, so to, these forces have been weakened, uh, uh, that these allies are no longer there in, in a government position. And so what you have finally, the only game in town will be the EU. And that goes on two fronts. And I will simply mention it in a, in a, uh, in a, in a headline so that uh, I don't take too much time. One process is, the institution themselves and the compromise that has been uh, 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 adopted is a cop-out because it adopts the rescue package. It keeps the conditionality for the rule of law, but it creates uh, such a complicated process or long uh, 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 extended process that would take about two years to, uh, 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 to sort a uh, uh, contested issue uh, through, the Euro through the European court. And uh, that is a way of saying to Orban, oh, nothing will happen until your next election. At least that's, that's, uh, 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 that's how he understood it. I, I'm, I'm not now go to, going into why this compromise was accepted, but it strikes me as a fail. On principle, on paper, it looks good. In practice, it seems to me pretty toothless. What matters, and that's my final word, will be not just institutions, but politics. The politics, particularly on the European right, the EPP, and that has been the key to that question uh, of tackling uh, uh, illiberal drift uh, from the beginning. And the EPP, as we know, the European People's Party, uh, the sort of center right, uh, a gathering in, in, in the European Parliament has been divided on this issue. For a long time, it has protected Orban, it has protected the liberals. It is now divided how to deal with them. And you have a clear split about those who want to accommodate and those uh, mainly German uh, 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 Christian Democrats uh, 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 and those who are prepared to take, take on the illiberals. And uh, those of you who follow this closely, I invite you to read the speech by uh, Donald Tusk, the former Polish prime minister and former president of the European Commission, who clearly took on his old friend, Viktor Orban. So this is not personal animosity, this is his former close friend. And he openly said, if you are doing what you're doing, uh, uh, you know, you claim you are a Christian Democrat, you're defending European values. Well, if you are uh, 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 
breaking the separation of the rule of law, uh, the separation of power, the rule of law, independent media, etc. You are not a Christian Democrat. And he was repeating that for each of the feature that he was describing and that he saw in Hungary, but of course also in Poland. So this is where we are. At the end of the day, it's a political divide and it will, be, have, to, it will have to be fought on the political level. Jacques, thank you so much. This was that was a that was a lot to lot lot, lot to chew on. Uh, Apologies chew on there. for taking too long. No, no worries whatsoever. I want to turn to 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 Katka for a, for a, for a few minutes, partly because Hungary is the country that has the longest experience with this brand of politics. Uh, as I was watching these images coming from the capital two weeks ago, I was reminded that in two thousand and six there were fringes of. Uh, of, of, of Hungary's political right, far right, that actually did not accept the outcome of the election either. And I was reminded by how polarized already at the end of that decade Hungary was. So, so really that decade of, of Viktor Orban's rule that followed was, was not a coincidence in a way. Uh, but now seeing the opposition working together, uh, you know, is there, is there a chance uh, this, this legacy can be, can be reversed. Uh, why should we be bullish on Hungary? Thank you very much, Dalibor. And uh, first of all, thank you for the American Enterprise Institution for having me on this panel this morning or this afternoon from where I am. Uh, I would speak about three things. Uh, first, where we are, uh, what will happen? And the third is that why should you care? So uh, Dalibor is very right. Uh, the events that are going on in Hungary, they has not started just a few years ago. We have a long history, but let me just remind everybody that our history takes us back way before the Iron Curtain was broken down. That we were a nation that were, was stuck in an oppressive regime and who always longed to be in the West, always longed for Western values, for democracy, for freedom of thought, expression. And I remember my mother's stories about sitting in the basement and listening to Radio Free Europe in secret. The, the mother of my parent, uh, of my partner, uh, she was an aspiring artist and she left to the United States at uh, in, in secrecy at the pickup truck, as base, uh, at, at the back of a pickup truck, because she wanted to practice art. And, and we were one of the first to, who, to break out of the, uh, from behind the Iron Curtain. And we were the front, uh, front leaders in democracy when we joined the European Union. And right now we are at a situation where Freedom House uh, does not classify Hungary as a democracy anymore. And if we would apply to the European Union today, we would not be accepted. So of course the question is obvious, what happened? And uh, I, I think it's very important to take note of uh, the importance of institutions and uh, the culture of democracy in a country. And this is what unfortunately Hungary did not have enough time to build up before uh, the financial crisis hit us. We had great expectations after the Iron Curtain came down approximately in the same time when I was born. Uh, and, and my parents and my grandparents, they thought that from this point on, it will be a joy ride. We will live like Austrians. We will live like the people in the United States. And of course, history is not so easy. And transitions are sometimes uh, problematic, particularly when the governing class is not ready to take on these challenges. So a lot of uh, Hungarians were disillusioned when the transition hit our country hard. And this was coupled by uh, devastating effects of the financial crisis in the 2000s. And in, as a result, in 2010, a center-right party called Fidesz, led by Mr. Viktor Orban, got elected with a supermajority by a lot of disillusioned people who wanted change in the country and who wanted better governance and uh, more... Uh, value-based way of doing politics. This was what Victor promised 10 years ago. And what happened in the last decade is uh, that under the pretense of giving back Hungary to the Hungarians, checks and balances were dismantled. The constitution was redrafted without public consultation. The free media was almost completely broke down. And uh, as a result of a new electoral law, 
mm, the opposition found itself in a very, very tricky situation. And I have to add, in the same time, we have been a members of the European Union and we received extreme amounts of uh, European funds to support our undeserved communities and to put our economies back to speed. And unfortunately, a great part of this money flowed to cronies and oligarchs in the central circle of the government. And these were the very same oligarchs who helped the government to stabilize their power. So basically, in a weird way, the European Union contributes, contributed and still contributes to a regime that destroys Europe and the European Union from the inside. And the way forward, I would believe that uh, there is of course, a lot and great expectations from the European Union to do something about this. I was also one of the negotiators of the uh, rule of law mechanism from the parliament side. And I think if it's interesting for our uh, audience, we might talk about this later. But I believe that fighting rule of law violations and fighting corruption are, have to go hand in hand. And keeping better checks off where our money goes is essential. This tool is not perfect. And as uh, Professor Rupnik said before, it's very complicated, but it has to be utilized and the European Parliament has to play a key role here. Role here. But of course, I know that we Hungarians have to take care of this problem. Uh, this is our role eventually to change this government. And I have to say for everybody who has given up on Hungary already, and I know that quite a lot of people think that we are lost cause and we will have Orban here until 2055 or something. I tell everybody to be optimistic because in 2019, the opposition won the local elections. Now, many of our cities are governed by opposition mayors and they are fighting daily for our freedoms and uh, for rights of people and for a better governance with the government who penalizes cities uh, day by day uh, they uh, cut the tax revenues of opposition-led cities. Uh, they are in a permanent war, even in the middle of the pandemic. And of course, this is the harsh example of bad governance and irresponsible behavior. But I believe that uh, with the same uh, unity we demonstrated two years ago, we will take on this government in 22 at the general elections, and we will lead back Hungary to the path of European democracies, where we have always belong. But let me, if I still have a few minutes, let me just very briefly talk about why does it matter for the international audience? Because I'm taking part in a lot of panels like this. And very often I had the question that like, yes, I'm very sorry that this happens to your country, but why should I care? Uh, I even have some Republican friends who say that, well, yeah, they, they seem like not really nice guys, but they might agree with Mr. Orban on, let's say, family policy. So, so a lot of people feel that this is none of their business. And I would really, really would like to argue with this because backsliding is a global phenomenon. And uh, these uh, wannabe autocrats and populist leaders, they actually take ideas from each other. So this is one thing, they empower each other. And of course, the stronger countries, they can empower smaller countries to act like them. But even Hungary with 10 million citizens, we are a, we are a member of the European Union, which is an essential partner, for instance, for the United States. Without the European Union, we cannot have a stable uh, democratic world order. And as Hungary and the Hungarian leaders are working to destabilize the European Union from the inside, uh, being an unreliable partner of NATO, regardless of our military spending, uh, we are actually, or at least the govern uh, government of my country is actually opening a door to malign influence uh, from the inside uh, Mr. Siarto, our foreign minister, is in uh, Moscow right now, just a few days ago, after a uh, few days after Mr. Navalny was arrested. We are the first country in Europe who will use the uh, Russian vaccines, for instance, which are not uh, have been allowed or yet by the European Medicines Authority. Uh, we are the first country who who opened their doors to China and Russia to an unbelievable extent. So this is also uh, external influence to the country, to our economic interests as Europe and as also the United States. And also the third thing, corruption. When, where corruption exists, international business cannot flourish. 
without stability, without reliability, and without good governance, also American companies are in danger who want to do business with either Hungary or from Hungary with the EU. Uh, and so this is why I would tell everybody to keep an open eye and uh, put the fight against corruption and against uh, autocracies to the global agenda, because international stability depends on the stability of uh, our communities. And if Hungary continues on this path and continues to destabilize the union from the inside, harboring autocrats uh, in the middle of our union, we will have a challenge uh, worldwide that reaches out of the borders of Hungary very much so. But I'm very much looking forward to the contribution to the others and also the questions that I hope I will get. Thank you. Kaska, Kaska thank you. Um, I want to turn to uh, Rastio Kacer, Ambassador Kacer. Um, you uh, spent four years in Budapest as Slovakia's ambassador uh, during the heyday of, of Orban's rule. Then you took a two-year break from, uh, from, from foreign service, and now you're back as Slovakia's ambassador to, to Prague. And uh, all of this sort of professional development has been happening against the backdrop of uh, you know, quite, a, quite a significant turmoil in Slovakia with the murder of... Uh, of, of a journalist and his fiance by, 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 by mobsters with political connections. Uh, there was the election of, of, of a new president two years ago, uh, which against the odds really brought a very pro-Western uh, rule of law and democracy grounded person to, to the highest office in the country. And, and there was also the election uh, last year that, that, that resulted in a change of government. Uh, and, and I wonder, uh, and I, I know that you can't really speak, you know, completely freely <laughs> as, a, as, as, as a professional diplomat, uh, but, but you know, what, what would be your, 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 your pitch to, especially to an American audience, for why one should remain optimistic about the prospects of democracy and rule of law in Central Europe? And what can be learned from these, from these particular these three examples mm. that, that you have direct experience with? All right. Hello uh, to everyone. Um, yes, I have limitations what a professional diplomat should have, but I'm very open. I pass that threshold of uh, being feared uh, by the openness. So uh, may I not be uh, too diplomatic on the things. I spent five years in Budapest uh, in 2013 until 2018. Um, and then two years um, I was gone uh, in Globsec in our back in service. Um, it was given a good explanation what we are, uh, what is the situation in Central Europe. Jacques did a um, very good job, uh, and you um, as well. And uh, maybe I'll do a little footnote uh, on Jacques used it a couple of times, this liberal uh, government. Um, here in Central Europe, that uh, language is often abused because Viktor Orban would tell, you know, I don't care about liberal government. I don't want to have liberal government. I want to have a conservative Christian democratic government. So here we have a confusion of vocabulary over the Atlantic, because uh, over the Atlantic, when we say liberal approach, we mean democratic. So there is a, a, a clear division of labor and a good political process, fair uh, political process. Uh, um, here in Central Europe, uh, we tend to abuse that and we say, I have the right to be conservative, I have, I have the right, I don't have to be liberal. So uh, we need to clarify that there is a little bit of a court uh, in using the language. Because uh, Viktor Orban is calling, you know, we have a, we, we have a you know, the liberal democracy, we have a Christian democratic uh, um, democracy, which is a mock-up, that's not, that's not a reality. Uh, Few words on where we are. I would very much subscribe what well, what was said. Uh, um, sometimes there are things which are even worse how they look like. But truth, true division here in Central Europe, when we will speak of Visegrad, where we will narrow all of the uh, Central European debate to Visegrad, there would be Hungary one case, Poland another case, and Czech and Slovak to me would be about one case as well. Uh, there are reasons we cannot go to historical reasons why Hungary is going uh, by this erosion as we see it and why Poland is behaving. To me, the most acute case is Hungary. This was uh, everybody agrees on that, not only because of quality of the political process. And, you know, here I have to be a little uh, beyond the side of Catalan, because often even foreign diplomats and, and, and 
foreigners, they would blame opposition, say, oh, you don't unite, you quarrel, you cannot get united. How do you want to fight? Well, you you know, it's hard to be united in a country where you it, where, where there is no fair political process, where you don't do not have a, a media which which you can use in a political competition. Uh, if completely NGO uh, life is is is, is almost uh, ruined, and uh, and the government concentrate uh, all of the powers in the way that there is um, very unfair political process uh, at all. You may have three elections, but if the three elections is the end of the process, uh, which is completely distorted, then, well, it, 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 it's bad. So uh, the case was, to me, quite sad, because frankly, by my personal civic uh, citizen values, I'm what would be called in Europe EPP style of liberal conservative. Uh, to me, in the early 90s, uh, Viktor Orban, uh, a number of friends, which I have uh, in the old Fidesz ranks, they would be a role model to me. I uh, look at the Fidesz as something uh, which was to admire. And I was very sorry to watch uh, how this ended up. Uh, and this is, to me, I, I, I pick, um, uh, this is the number one in this uh, kind of uh, countdown, <laughs> Central European countdown. Uh, because on the top of the uh, of, of the bad political uh, competition and process, what we have there, uh, it, it's a weird uh, strategic uh, erosion, uh, which we don't see happening in Poland. Because as uh, as, as Katalin was stressing, Peter is in Moscow now, uh, and this is not only about him being in Moscow now. That's been continuously in the last couple of years flirting. Uh, um, well, with uh, Mr. Putin, um, the way how he's doing things in, in Crimea and Eastern Ukraine, by not only uh, him, but a uh, whole attempt by uh, President Trump to create a league of uh, conservative uh, politicians uh, in Europe, which conservative means authoritarian loving people uh, or an adm admiring people. So. Uh, this this failed. Uh, all of us were afraid that COVID uh, can turn Europe into more nationalistic and uh, more closed uh, and more EU um, erosive. Seems like this is not that urgent now. The pendulum swings a little bit. Uh, we will see whether successfully to the end or not. Uh, but um, uh, again, for, for, for all of the reasons, I think uh, Hungary is it's a special case on its own right. And, uh, and I'll come at the end uh, in the question how optimistic I am about the possibility of change. And I agree change is necessary because here what Catalan was saying is absolutely important. These examples, they serve like an infection. Uh, when I was out there and we talking EU ambassadors, NATO ambassadors, I always stressed don't underestimate these things because it serves in politics like an infection and if you don't treat we see it on COVID if you don't treat infection properly at the beginning then it gets out of control. In Poland uh, I see um, at least healthy sense uh, of, of, of strategy where we are that uh, Europe is important uh, that the NATO is important and that we should play a fair game uh, and I don't expect that Poland would ever go into the bed uh, with Mr. Putin uh, so, um, uh, and I, I also I think on the level of freedom of media, uh, that we see abuse of state on media, but freedom of the media, uh, a healthy uh, civic society, it, it's still a little different case uh, than we see down south. Uh, division, it's, it's final within Visegrad uh, with Czechs and Slovaks, and here the catharsis happened in Slovakia. But it could happen uh, because the freedom of media was there. Uh, civic society was very strong. Probably, I would say, uh, in today's Visegrad countries in Slovakia, there is the strongest um, civic society. I was part of that um, in a certain sense, and still I am. Uh, and, and Czech Republic equally. The quality of journalism, the strength of um, the strength of uh, civic society, but also the quality of political process is plus minus the same. I'm not saying that there are no challenges. I'm not saying that there are no uh, itches, itching for uh, more of a tough approach uh, and that we do not have parties uh, who are semi-Nazi parties or uh, who would wish to have authoritarian uh, rule in the country or admire all the crazy things. Uh, we do, but they are not a uh, threatening part of our political spectrum. They may become, like we see in a number of other European countries, uh, but it's not that urgent. 
Uh, what is the potential of change? Uh, probably what should be done? Uh, I see limited potential of change right now in Hungary, frankly. I'm, I'm a little skeptical, which doesn't mean that things cannot turn upside down with this COVID crisis uh, and uh, an opposition more united and more attention paid with a new administration uh, in the United States. So it's like the ingredients are aligning uh, for, for potential of, uh, of, of, of democratic turn up. Uh, and I would be the first one in the row in my heart, uh, would you sing on that, uh, if, if, if that, if that happens. Uh, what worried me was a little bit, you know, all of the trend of erosion uh, within all of the European context. You know, we see a strong info war going on all around the Europe. Russia is paying a lot of money into eroding uh, all of uh, all of the strength uh, and the potential for Europe. Uh, we I don't think we don't pay enough attention here, uh, but um, I'm I'm hopeful. In we need to handle well the vaccination process. We need to handle well uh, all of the things uh, with the recovery funds. And uh, here uh, to illustrate to you what was the debate. Of course, that was the attempt to have a united uh, Visegrad uh, view on that, which would be negative. My government was uh, very much opposing that. Uh, it was driven by our foreign minister, Ivan Korchuk, who is stressing at every single uh, opportunity the importance of value-based foreign policy, of value-based democratic policy inside. And here, uh, I'm, I absolutely admire that approach. Here, I'm on the same uh, league uh, with uh, Dan Fried, who was even enumerating, illustrating that if the politics is based on the right uh, balance of values and the right balance of interests, so reason and law goes hand in hand, it, it, it's producing the best result. And Slovak approach here for the rule of law was that the rule of law is fundament, it's a cement, it's a ground uh, for EU. If we erode that, then whole, whole the structure, uh, whole the house will collapse down. And uh, I was uh, present at his talks with uh, Foreign Minister Petricek here, and there was a strong accord on that, and the governments went hand in hand. On Central Europe, and I well, will end up here with the illustration, uh, we for is an organization which is here and will continue to exist. We don't want to kill it, we just want to use it. And, and you will see it when it comes to the Slovak Visegrad presidency that we will, uh, the title of that will be solutions for Europe, because we see uh, um, anything, including Visegrad, only in that dimension. It's good to have regional cooperation, but it must serve a greater purpose to have Europe stronger. Slovaks, Czechs now using uh, much more vigorously a uh, new format, well, a kind of new format, S3, Slavko free. Um, just the day before yesterday, uh, we got an online debate uh, with Minister uh, Petricek, uh, Korczok, uh, Austrian colleague, including Slovenia, into this debate. And uh, we are very much also based on the experience of Visegrad, uh, now searching for more of the alliances within the Europe, which will be on the agenda alliances. So seeking partners uh, for to discuss and take stock of the things where we are, were allied by the agenda. So you may see Slovakia, Czech Republic, also others looking into uh, asymmetric uh, internal uh, alliances, where I say with Danes, sometimes with Nordics, on some of the agenda with the South. So uh, and, and that's, that's the way. So I'll stop here and I'll wait for, for questions and I'll be as open as I, am, as I can be. Thank you very much. Rasta, thank you so much. This was this was very enlightening. I want to turn to to Ludek for 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 a few minutes, and I want to uh, frame it, frame 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 this conversation as as a bit of a puzzle. When you dial back the clock eight or nine years, uh, you look at the Czech Republic with Andrei Babiš, the second wealthiest Czech at the country in, in at the time in the country, you know, buying two broadsheet newspapers announcing he was entering politics uh, against the background of you know, dwindling trust in traditional political parties. Uh, one would think that um, everything was set up for 
a de-democratization or backsliding of the sort uh, we've seen over the recent years in, in, in Hungary and Poland. Uh, yet that did not quite happen. And you wonder if it's because of Czech institutions being stronger than the ones in Poland and Hungary, or because of Andrei Babish and his political movement just being uh, you know, a different political animal than, than, than the Law and Justice Party in Poland and, and, and Fidesz uh, in Hungary. And if it is a different animal, what does it mean for the future of the Czech Republic? And, and how do you see the country evolve uh, going forward on, 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 these, on, these, on, on these on these metrics? So thank you. And first of all, thank you for inviting me. And you are right that Czech case really raised a lot of question mark in understanding what is the difference if we are really facing kind of inten uh, intentional strategy of de-democratization or if we are just uh, rather facing the situation when uh, people are just exceeding uh, uh, exceeding limits uh, of normal governing the country uh, and this is for me the big uh, big question but um, uh, let me start by saying that i fully agree with jack rupnik that uh, the facts and figures are showing that we see backsliding uh, talking about the check from longer perspective it could be well illustrated by the fact who is our president and who was our president we all remember Václav Havel to be the first president of uh, Czech Republic uh, or Czechoslovakia after the Velvet uh, Revolution. Then he was replaced by Václav Klaus. Václav Klaus is now probably the strongest, the most influential, uh, influential uh, anti-EU uh, figure, uh, the person that is very friendly with uh, Russia and the person who is ignoring the measures to protect people uh, against the pandemia. And our current president is probably the most vocal supporter of Russia and China within, within the Europe. And obviously what is scaring and what illustrates this backsliding is that many people just don't, don't care. Uh, I guess Mr. Babish is a good example of a really one puzzle that I don't have clear answer. If it's really kind of international effort of people like Viktor Orban or Mr. Kaczynski to turn around the development and, and to, to push country to different direction, or to which extent we see, and especially I guess it holds for the Hungary, very aggressive way of governing, very strong effort to keep power in, 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 in its hands and to make sure that there will be no election when your party will lose, uh, lose uh, the, uh, the power. And especially uh, if, uh, if the governments like governments of Mr. Orban or uh, even probably in Poland doesn't have any kind of special good results, they must uh, secure the support through other means than just delivering a good result of, of governing of the, of the country. So for me, obviously, uh, each politician who is serious politician wants to be re-elected, you know, or at least majority, majority of them. There is nothing strange about it. But uh, the way how people like Viktor Orban wants to secure his re-election are the strange because they are really exceeding the limits and they are causing huge, huge harms. And here I must say, I guess Radoslav was talking about it. This is the, the risk of infection that they infect the others because if some people believe that this is the way how to keep the power in your hands, then they can be inspired. Here I want to mention what is the role of EU because I guess EU is to some extent kind of amplifier of the of the problem. EU is and should be a rule-based, value-based uh, society and uh, it is quite heterogeneous. So you need to make the compromises to keep it uh, going. So uh, unless there are compromises, there are conflicts, there are the problems. And very often, as we have seen in uh, voting for the budget, uh, people like Viktor Orban and, uh, or, or Polish are the source of the, the conflict. I guess they go into the conflict not for either ideological reasons, but for very pragmatic reasons, because they believe that they will sell this conflict well to, to their own electorate. So that means that, uh, that uh, the... Uh, really a very aggressive way of governing if not the strategy to turn around of the society is due to eu membership much more visible than it would be uh, would be otherwise but still and you dalibor started with mr babish i must say that 
I still don't have good answer what is strategy and what is just a so-called pragmatism. Because if you look at Mr. Babish, first of all, when he form formulate his party, he has many uh, quite a, quite a important liberals around him who help him to form party. And he was clearly marketing himself as to be a liberal, as to be pro-EU, pro-West uh, pro uh, figure. And only as he uh, lost the trust of people that that uh, consider this direction uh, important, he turned around completely and he went for very different electorate and very, very significantly changed his rhetoric. But he's still able to make a very strong uh, pro-liberal, pro-democracy, pro-EU, pro-transatlantic alliance statements. At the, at the same time, five minutes later, he can see he can see something uh, something completely opposite. So if he can say his sign, uh, his biggest kind of sign or feature is inconsistency, and the way how consistent in, he is in his uh, inconsistency. But let me now go to to the second point that I want to share for the for the beginning, and this is basically for me the reason why people, uh, not only in Visegrad countries, are turning to such a political figures like. Uh, like uh, uh, Mr. Orban, Andrei Babish, or Mr. Kaczynski. I guess that uh, it's not uh, the intention of people to give up or to compromise on uh, the democracy, but this is uh, a result of failure of previous governments to deliver what people were expecting. Uh, sometimes maybe expectations were very high, but at the same time, many economic or social failures, corruption, huge incompetence, clientelism, and so on, are behind the current political situation in countries like, like, uh, like V4. And obviously, uh, most of them were associated with the governing uh, period of the country or of the parties that were kind of rather traditional that emerged after Velvet Revolution and were to some extent associated with uh, with uh, democracy and uh, and uh, the, the freedom. So uh, I would say that many governments in V4 in the previous years have failed significantly. And the result of dissatisfaction of the people have led uh, them to vote for people that just make uh, very cheap uh, promises. Uh, and if uh, these populists fail in their real uh, governance, in the way how they govern the country, they most likely will turn to another very similar people that will again make a very si simple and nice uh, promises unless these standard parties will, will gain back uh, the confidence. And obviously, uh, in uh, current work, and no one here talk about the social networks, about influence of media that are in some countries restricted by the governments, because there is, a, there is intentional effort to restrict the independent media to turn public media to government media and and so on and in such an environment to basically prevail to get back confidence with responsible programs with representation of the uh, of the uh, the values on which our society should be based is much more difficult than just to stay in front of the crowd and say that all previous politicians were jerks, they are incompetent, and I will send them to the uh, to the prison. Uh, what will be now? It's uh, hard to say. I guess Slovakia is a very good case when the government that I would not say that the democratization was the main feature of Mr. Fitzgerald government. I guess it was a very strong tolerance of 
clientelism, mafia, and so on. So this government failed uh, as the result of outbreak of activity of civil society. That is fantastic. And Slovak succeeds, actually. We have even bigger demonstration in Prague, and it, ha it has done nothing to, to, to Mr. Babish, I must say. But uh, uh, the, this government was replaced by the uh, government led by clear populist, by someone who is who doesn't have a very strong, uh, very strong competence in governing uh, of the country, who is probably not loyal to, to principles on which the society is based. And we can just uh, guess what will be the result. So, so one quite a concerning point is that even if uh, the people that are, I believe, uh, greatly misusing uh, the power and also sometimes uh, directing society wrong way, if they lose power, it's not granted that we will get back to uh, that uh, theoretically ideal world of someone uh, for, who, for whom democracy, freedom, uh, common Europe, transatlantic partnership, value-based policy, human rights, and so on, are the key of his, uh, of his, uh, his acting. So let me finish here, and I look forward for, for discussion. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I want to turn uh, to Radek, who's been waiting very patiently for, uh, for, 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 for a while now. Um, and I would like to probably try to bring a transatlantic angle to the, to the conversation a little bit since, since, since Radek chairs the um, EP's uh, US delegation. Uh, one of the striking features of Hungary and Poland, among other things, are the, the foreign policy outlooks with regard to, to the United States, where prior to the November election, it looked like all of the, bar, all of the chips were placed on, on the possibility of Trump's, Trump's re-election. And in, in, in the case of Hungary's Speaker of Parliament, uh, you know, even after the election, he was spouting conspiracy theories about, about voter fraud and, and Arizona, Pennsylvania, uh, and, 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 and ballot stuffing and, 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 and so forth. And, and to me, uh, that, that sort of determination to, to sort of stick with Trump uh, at all costs, even though there was a fairly decent chance that, that, that Joe Biden would win the election, struck me as, as completely crazy, given, given the importance of, uh, uh, of, of the United States for for, 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 for the region. So as, as opposed to, you know, the, the, the Czechs and Slovaks hedging their bets much more, uh, much more carefully. How do you explain, uh, explain that? Is it just ideological blindness? Is it, is it, is it, is it more? And how are, going, uh, how are these two countries going to uh, essentially get back to, to, to having a, a, a functioning working relationship with the, with, 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 with the US and the new administration? Um, thank you for inviting me. Time is short, I understand, so I'll be brief. Um, of course, you're right. Uh, um, I didn't follow the Hungarian debate, but in Poland, the government put all of its baskets in uh, eggs in uh, Trump's uh, uh, basket. But it's not crazy. It's bad foreign policy, I agree. But it's not necessarily bad politics. Um, in July, we had a presidential election. Uh, Trump did for our incumbent what no other US president would have done for another incumbent. Uh, he invited him to uh, Washington and gave him uh, a press conference three weeks before the uh, election, which we estimate uh, gave uh, um, the uh, PIS candidate about 1% of the vote. So in the middle of the pandemic, they steamrolled through um, the um, uh, re-election of the president. He eventually won by a, a, a percentage and a half, uh, thanks to Trump's help. Um, uh, what is worrying on this uh, in Poland is that the chief foreign policy advisor uh, said after the uh, results were announced that uh, the vote, it, that, that's just the first round. The second round will be in the courts and the third round will be in the streets, suggesting that Trump may be able to overturn the verdict of the voters and that they will still stick with Trump. 
Uh, and uh, Polish state media are still promoting the uh, conspiracy theories and uh, the uh, government uh, politicians are still saying that the election is, uh, was stolen. Um, look, the world is going to be a much lonelier place for our populists. Uh, what their, their ideal model was Franco's Spain, internal dictatorship, but with support from Washington as a signal to their electorate that, that um, things are under control. We, we are not isolated. In fact, uh, the, the, we have the support of the um, most powerful country on earth. Uh, that was their model and it, it didn't work out, but they, uh, they, they risked uh, looking silly, which they now do, um, because that was a, a, an attractive way of, of not having to correct course. Let, let me say why I think they are winning. Um, I was very struck by this uh, putsch on capital and by the kinds of people who participated in it. Did you notice the, um, uh, the woman who I think has now been uh, arrested, an estate agent who went to Washington uh, in her own private jet? She sounds like a complete idiot, but she's not a poor person or a completely uneducated person. There were many veterans. These were not poor people uh, storming the Bastille. This was people who were fired ideologically. And I'm convinced in my view that contrary to, to most Western commentariat, this wave of populism is not based, to use a Marxist phrase, in the base, but in the superstructure. These people are not motivated by poverty or by missed economic chances. These people are motivated by strife for meaning and by the decline of religiosity and by having alternative facts. They levitate um, above um, the, 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 the real world. And it's important to understand why, because if we get the diagnosis wrong, then we can't pr prescribe a, a good cure. And I put to you that the proportion of people inclined to authoritarian solutions in most Western countries is similar. It's about a third. In Poland, they got 38%, they're now at 35%, but in many countries, it's very similar. And of course, what matters is whether 30 something percent, given your electoral system and given what the rest of the political spectrum does, ever gives you a chance to capture power. And in Poland, they got lucky back in 2015. The left went uh, into the election as four different committees 15% of the vote was uh, wasted and they captured power. And once you capture power, you can do a lot with it. So uh, Kaczynski goes by, it, it's, it's kind of boring how faithfully he goes by the um, authoritarian uh, plan, by the plan of uh, Orban and Erdogan. He captured state media which are now a, a, a mouthpiece of really crude, nasty propaganda. This is not Fox, it's the Sturmer, in, including anti-Semitism. But the point is it works. Uh, in many parts of Poland, that's the only, uh, the, 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 the news channel of state TV is the only news channel they have because it's the only one you can watch um, on terrestrial TV in high definition. And what I'm saying is that it's getting worse, not better, because the more years you're subjected to, to this propaganda, the more brainwash you, brainwashed you become. Um, we don't have an election for the next three years. Um, and um, what needs to be done is what Biden has done. I encourage you to read a, 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 a paper that's been published in, uh, uh, but it's a translation of a Biden uh, paper of how they fought 
the um, battle in social media, how they made a conscious effort and they spent real money on trying to reach out to other silos and, and by what means they did it. Um, it, it. Facebook and Twitter are old hat. It's now these game, game, uh, uh, gaming uh, apps and TikTok and, uh, and some others that I hadn't even heard of. And you have to do what the Lincoln Project has done. They discovered that the only way to persuade soft populists, soft, soft authoritarians, is by allowing um, uh, uh, former supporters of that faction to speak to those who are still there. We are not credible to those people. They will never listen to us. They, are, they will only listen to people who, who will say, well, I used to support President Trump, but, um, but I got off, off that train because. And that sometimes works. And that's what we need to do. And then lastly, of course, everything, almost everything depends on what the opposition does. In Poland, we have the don't counting system of the votes. Um, again, the, 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 bad, the bad people are lucky. If Kaczynski's vote were counted truly proportionally at the last election, he would have two, 200 MPs. And he has 235 MPs, and that's five MPs more than, than he needs. Um, uh, and under that, that system, um, it puts a premium on large parties. We can only afford to have one, maximum two opposition lists. And it's, so it's very simple. If the opposition unites, they have a chance. If they don't, they have zero chance. That's my message. It's terrific. Um, thank you so much. If, I think if there is a one common thread going through the experience of the Visegrad countries and also uh, through the experience of the United States lately, it really is, um, is, is this sort of structural change in politics. That it used to be the case that political scientists would, would describe electoral outcomes in terms of the so-called median voter theorem. Basically, the voter who is in the middle decides, uh, and with the erosion of political parties, with uh, the rise of social media, it looks like uh, increasingly uh, politicians are not afraid of the median voter, but of the loudest voices on the fringes. And I think that that holds across countries. Uh, it sort of unfolds differently in different places because of historical contingencies and, and, and so forth. But I think that's the, the sort of common, common problem that, 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 that really needs to be fixed if democracies are, are to work uh, properly. There is a bunch of questions already from, uh, from, from our viewers and listeners. I have a few of my own. Uh, I want to start with one thing. Um, we haven't really mentioned the pandemic very much, except for, for Ambassador uh, Kasher. Um, so th there is one, one aspect of the pandemic which has to do with, 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 with the vaccination. So when you look at the countries uh, that seem to be doing well in terms of the rollout of the vaccine, you know, it's Israel with Benjamin Netanyahu somewhere on the popular spectrum, if you will. It's the UK with, with Boris Johnson somewhere on the populist spectrum. Um, I mean, the US has picked up uh, in, in, in recent recent week, week or so. Um, I mean, the EU uh, seems to be lagging behind. And I think there are reasons for that that have to do with you know, some of the procurement decisions made last year. Uh, maybe the commission wasn't really on top of this agenda the way it, 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 it should have been. And I worry to, to some extent when, when all is said and done, whether uh, a possible failure or a delay in, in vaccination in the EU will, will not serve as a pretext for you know, people like Viktor Orban or, or, or Kaczynski to say, look, if you want something done, we have to do it ourselves. Like, you know, why should we be doing this jointly with, with other European countries? Ultimately, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And, and maybe you know the, the sort of hasty rollout of, of the Sputnik vaccine in Hungary is 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 is, 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 is part of this. Uh, to what extent does the panel share my concern 
about this, and I'll let anybody speak who, who wants to speak uh, on, 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 on this issue. Um, I can start uh, yeah. because you brought up the Hungarian example also. So let me start by saying that uh, it was a very interesting reckoning, I think, for the last year for a lot of Hungarian voters. Uh, Mr. Orban has been super lucky for the last decade. He has been governing under very, very favorable economic circumstances globally. Uh, and as we are a small and open economy, what happens in the world uh, has a very strong effect on what happens inside the country. So basically all he had to do uh, is to wage war against uh, invisible enemies. He waged war against the UN, against uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, the E, no, the Brussels, not the EU, Brussels on numerous occasions. And now uh, he, he is in a position that where he actually has to govern and solve problems. And uh, it has been not really a success story so far. So our debt rate is very, very high. The economic response uh, is very far from adequate. Uh, and he is he's losing support. So right now, the united opposition polls higher than, uh, than, than, than Mr. Orban. Um, so that's uh, just in brackets for the chances for the future. Uh, but we got, and this is why he really jumped on this opportunity to uh, capitalize on the slow rollout from Brussels. Uh, well, the only thing that he forgets to communicate is that without the joint uh, EU uh, procurement um, effort, which of course has its flaws, a small country like Hungary with 10 million people living inside uh, would set, uh, stand zero chance of uh, getting the number of vaccinations they would need if it would be a free for all race on the market. It would probably be good for Germany, I think, but it would be very bad for Hungary. Uh, so, and and, and will they not where... say, when, when, they, when they say that, look, Israel did it, right? And they now vaccinated a third of the population. Uh, why should we be wasting our time with, 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 with the Brussels bureaucracy? I mean, I, I, the sort of argument I expect. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, like and a... This is what they are doing, yeah, that like Brussels is the obstacle. But, uh, well, if every European country would compete against each other on the market, we are not as rich as Israel. Uh, so we are very, very far away from being as rich as Israel. Uh, so, so we would be in a disadvantage. And... Uh, I think what Radek very rightly touched upon the, the media situation is, is a very big obstacle here because I think the opposition really tries to put their our points through, but the avenues are very limited. However, I, I really think that the pandemic can be, can be a breaking point for, for all those who just listen to the lies and the hate and the stirring of sentiments globally, not only in Hungary, but globally. Uh, and, and the response, what the government gave to the pandemic, how they helped people in need, uh, it, it is really a breaking point. So of course it can go both ways, but I'm more optimistic than before that uh, finally, like after quite a long time, more and more people demand like real answers and real solutions and not only like big boasts of communication about whatever grandeur they project. And I believe that the US election result has also something to do with the pandemic response. And I really hope that the prestige of good governance finally returns in a time when nothing is needed more than good governance. Chris, I know that Ludek and uh, Raske wanted to react briefly as well. Uh, I uh, I would agree with first part of what Katka said, but uh, I'm not sure about the second. I guess there is no doubt that people like Viktor Orban or Andrei Babish have terribly failed vis-a-vis uh, -vis the pandemic. But uh, uh, the same can be said for Donald Trump, and he lost the election just by a relatively small uh, margin. He's getting more than 70 uh, million of uh, votes, uh, some of these 
are really very convinced that he's the best president they can have. So I'm still not sure if this uh, failure to deliver uh, will have a clear impact on elections, even if they take place uh, this year. The second point I want to make uh, is that what I can see in Czech, and it's very, uh, very disturbing. And uh, I should say that we still have very high quality media and also independent media in the Czech Republic. But uh, still, it seems to me that uh, that the politicians like our president, like our pl uh, prime minister, were very successful in closing our minds in our territory. So when prime minister would say that uh, we are very successful in vaccination, Despite of the fact that you can just look at some very basic facts that are available in media and you can see it's exactly opposite way around, uh, it's not so much uh, so much disputed by media and it's accepted by the by the people. When uh, when the pandemia was not so bad, for example, our media were comparing the number of new infected people in Czech Republic with number of new infected in Germany, not taking into the account that uh, the Germany is just slightly bigger than the Czech Republic. So unfortunately, we we are so much. Uh, uh, reducing the discussion into Czech country, into Czech ways, into Czech problems and not looking outside. So that means, uh, I guess, that despite of the fact that we are probably one of top 10 countries that really failed, failed very badly with the pandemia, I would say that 80% of people would be very convinced that we do just average way. So that means that the... That the uh, basically fully justified punishment of the governments who uh, managed, who governed the country so poorly, maybe will not uh, will not appear, uh, unfortunately. And second thing I just want to say, I guess the pandemia was uh, for many people very strong wake up call because uh, they understand that despite of all these 30 years of trying to build our society, despite of 15 years of very generous support from, from uh, other, uh, other EU countries through EU budget, we are still so far away uh, when compare how our country function and how function Austria or Germany. I must say that this is uh, one of the very frustrating results of uh, last year. Ah, oh, Dalibor, you made an excellent point. Uh, before I go to this, you know, Ludek, thing is that good thing is that uh, Czech uh, healthcare system proved to be one of the best in Europe. Uh, I'm not commenting about the governments, but uh, a flattering thing is when you would look and compare uh, how 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 hospitals and healthcare handle this. Uh, it's admirable, and it shows that uh, this is a, this is a, a top league in Europe. But I want to come back, Dalibor, to your point. And uh, Radek made a very good explanation to a puzzling question why some of uh, politicians will stick to uh, Trumpism or supporting Trump to the end. Because they will continue on that. They cannot return. They already passed the point of no return. They sat on the horse, uh, which is irreversible. Um, so they will continue in this jungle of conspiracies in all of this muddied space uh, uh, where truth uh, is completely irrelevant uh, and facts are completely irrelevant. And they are getting ready uh, to for, for these arguments. Also, um, having an alternative scenarios. And that's why when I was saying that Victor is the very special case because of uh, strategic deviation, here we see it clearly, uh, this vaccination think he's getting ready uh, for having an argument for escape. And there are some, I think the vaccination will turn into the prestige uh, uh, race uh, at the end. Uh, governments were underestimating this, including my own government, and uh, underestimated how, how this will turn into the race of prestige. Clearly, uh, on, on my respect to the British government, that they understood uh, before everything started that they need to prove that they are better uh, than the EU. We saw it on the US side, and I'm not commenting Israel because Israel has been, has been having these clever strategies uh, for a long time. We can only you know, watch how 10 million country can be efficient 
uh, that's a completely another chapter. But here, if Victor would be right at the end, because the cycle plays in his advantage, uh, probably when the election will come, already this COVID wave will be passed. And if he could have proven at the end all of this, look, I was not only betting on EU, I set my horses also on China and Russia and the Sputnik works. And we were one of those who vaccinated early and uh, you know, we got things under control. I think it would have a strong, uh, it, 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 he would have a strong argument and it will play, it will work uh, in Hungary, I'm afraid. And, in, and in, on the top of that also, UK uh, will succeed and some other smaller countries like us, Czech Republic or Slovakia would underestimate this. Uh, this will be, a, it will be a hard blow into whole strategy competition. I think here the efficiency of EU is, is, is of paramount, is of paramount experience. Uh, if we fail on this, um, um, it will, it will help. It will assist uh, this uh, saloon autocrats or, or the smart uh, autocracy very much so. One, one of our viewers suggests that Central and Eastern Europe has a very different history from Western Europe, has no <clears throat> experience of, say, the glorious revolution um, of, of, of the late uh, 1600s, uh, and England has no experience of the French Revolution, uh, and, uh, and, and so suggests that maybe that should be just acknowledged, and maybe Central and Eastern Europe should part ways with the old Europe. And I think that's, the, that's a great moment to turn to Jacques to explain to us and to our viewer and to an American audience why that is a bad idea. Your... Uh, yes, it certainly is a bad idea. I, I think the, uh, uh, it is true that in a uh, number of uh, Western perception, the East-West divide has resurfaced. Sort of 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the East-West divide has resurfaced. And of course, a lot of the developments in Central Europe uh, seem to uh, confirm indeed that there is a ground for, you, you, had, you had a divide on the question of democracy that we have been debating, uh, liberal democracy, the question of the rule of law, uh, uh, etc. So you have uh, one divide and you had the divide over the migrant issue. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, that goes back to 2015 and the whole question of uh, nationhood, how you define nation, you know, and the question of the open society, a number of issues related to that. And then you have a third divide, which concerns um, uh, societal issues or cultural, what, what, what uh, you, could, uh, you could call cultural divide or culture wars. And in fact, you know, that brings me to what uh, Radek was saying. It is very true, you know, if you just try to explain the rise of the populist uh, uh, in Central Europe through uh, economic explanations, I don't find it very uh, satisfactory because you look at the figure, et cetera. And of course, I'm aware of the fact that the uh, impact uh, of the economic growth of the last period uh, uh, has been uneven in the regions, has been unevenly distributed, but you cannot have a, a, a sufficiently plausible explanation just through socio socioeconomic uh, uh, issues, uh, which is actually dominant in the literature. If you look at the academic literature, this is very much the dominant, you know, the winners and losers of globalization, the winners and losers of the transition. I don't buy it completely. I think the, 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 the cultural divides are very deep and very important. And in fact, if you look at Orban's discourse uh, uh, and Kaczynski and others, uh, they build on that They say, no, no, I mean, uh, you talk to us about European values, uh, you know, uh, the rule of law, etc. Well, we are the true defenders of European values, the Christian conservative values you have abandoned, and we are protecting them against the uh, 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 open uh, free for all that you are advocating, including the migrant invasion that you have tolerated. That's in a nutshell what, what they are trying to say. So yes, there is this uh, divide uh, that has resurfaced. Uh, do you attribute it to the fact that they uh, had uh, a different uh, um, uh, development of uh, in terms of their democratic past and I, I guess from the question that would be there, not 
not just the immediately pre-communist past, but way back. Yes, indeed, the, perhaps the democratic traditions in some parts of Central Europe, one would have to differentiate, are weaker than elsewhere. The development of civil society was much, uh, 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 came later, much was much weaker. So in this sense, yes, there are differences. There's no reason uh, 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 30 years ago, I even writ, wrote a book about that, the other Europe trying to explain in what way the other Europe was other. So these differences do exist, but the main difference consists co concerned the question of nationhood and statehood. And uh, uh, because the countries of East Central Europe in different ways were part of multinational empires and their main political endeavor was national emancipation. And the whole question was a combination of the national and the democratic. Uh, whereas the question of statehood, at least for uh, some of the main countries in Western Europe was considered as uh, 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 solved. So yes, that is, uh, uh, there is a different, the long term difference is perhaps in this question of understanding nation, the cultural definition of the nation. The nation is defined by language, a culture, uh, sometimes a religious dimension, because if you don't have statehood, you have the, the preeminence of, yeah, the German definition of the nation, if you want, Kulturnation as opposed to a civic definition of the nation related to statehood and citizenship. So yes, that is a long historical difference. Uh, uh, I would not attribute uh, uh, all the issues we have been discussing <laughs> in our panel to this historical difference. It certainly provides an, an insight into the attitudes on the question of migration and national identity and the capacity for certain parties in power today, Orban, Kaczynski and many others to play on this card. We are protecting the nation uh, from an outside invasion, the migrants from Muslim countries and from the intrusions of the European Union and which is a question of sovereignty. So they combine sovereignty, sovereignty and national and identity politics. And that combination, yes, it's a powerful combination that is at work in Central Europe in recent years and today, but I certainly would not you know, go back to saying, oh, this is Eastern Europe, that's why they, they are different. Because then you have differences between Northern and Southern Europe. Are differences between Eastern and Western Europe more important than between Northern and Southern Europe? Oh my God, you know, that, that would be for, for another discussion and, and my time is up. <laughs> Great, thank you. Actually, my chat box is overflowing with questions, but I'm also cognizant of the fact that it's already 11 o'clock, which means it's 5 p.m. in Europe and I certainly don't want to stand between you and and the cocktail hour, so so, so I, I do I do do think we have to draw this to a close. I, I want to thank our panelists for for joining me um, today. Uh, I want to thank the audience for for the thoughtful questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to to all of them. Uh, I hope that for those on the panel and also in the audience who are joining AI for the first time for an event. Uh, this is only the beginning of a long and warm relationship uh, with, with AI. You can check our scholars' work and, and our future events on our website, AI.org or on social media. And I look forward to welcoming you to our functions again soon, hopefully in person. Again, thank you and have a great weekend, everybody. <laughs>